Gregoire here. He's going to speak today about Austria's marriage with Iran, support for nuclear program versus historic responsibility. Diana is a journalist, a political analyst, and a researcher. She's currently uh, a foreign correspondent in New York for the Austrian newspaper Der Standard and the Press. And she's a political analyst, analyst rather, with Reality EU, which is based in New York, and she's a specialist on issues of Iran. Um, in 2006, she was a media fellow at the Israel Project in New York and also in Washington. And she worked with the Medical Tribune of Vienna and a news magazine Profil in Vienna as well. She did her PhD at the University of Vienna in Austria in uh, communication studies and journalism. And her dissertation dealt with issues, it was entitled Language as Home on, on Jewish Identity and How Do Austrian Holocaust Survivors Deal with the Problem of Their Native Country and Their Feeling for Homeland? And What Are the Impacts of the Holocaust and the Feeling of Heimat? Homeland. 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 And what kind of influence does language have on Jewish identity? So, given the background of looking at the Holocaust and, and issues of Jewish identity in post Holocaust lands, and certainly dealing with Iran, which is an issue of contemporary forms of, uh, and choosing my words deliberately, of genocidal anti Semitism or incitement to genocidal anti Semitism, um, this subject is very important. And it's also relevant because, and I think we'll probably touch on it, uh, in Germany recently some corporations are purportedly divesting from Iran, but we were speaking earlier, and I've also spoke with some bankers earlier today, that the divestment, unilateral divestment of major corporations, I would be suspect of for all sorts of reasons, having spoken to bankers this morning and you, but also having been in the anti-apartheid movement, I remember when North American corporations divested from South Africa, you know, Canada and the United States, they set up subsidiaries, the corporations set up subsidiaries immediately. And there was much more pressure on them in those days to divest from South Africa than there are, for example, for German corporations to go out of uh, Iran. So it's a very important, timely topic, and we're really honored to have you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for, for uh, having me. Thank you so much. It's my honor. It's not the other way around. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, it's a huge privilege for me, and I do appreciate the invitation. So, uh, as you said, the title of my uh, my talk here is Austria's marriage with Iran. Uh, and the topic might sound uh, maybe might sound a little strange, as it's uh, it's about Austria, which seems to be such a side topic, since Austria is just a small country in the middle of Europe. So, why choose this topic? Um, of all the possible potential other countries that we could focus on. Um, I chose the topic not only because uh, I'm, I'm Austrian myself, and that, that's why you know, I had a lot of time to be focusing on this issue, but also because um, Austria is uh, the one country where OMV, who is Austria's biggest energy company, has closed uh, the biggest deal of any European country that has ever closed a deal with Iran. So oh, Austria's OMV has uh, closed this enormous deal, so that's why I feel this uh, country is definitely worth to be focusing on. But let me first elaborate a little bit on uh, Austrian-Iranian ties, and I'll jump back in history just a little bit in order to give you a bigger picture. Um, in 1938, when uh, the Führer Adolf Hitler uh, entered the country, uh, a large number of Austrians welcomed him. A huge number of Austrians supported uh, the Nazis in carrying out uh, the final solution, what they call the so-called final solution, by serving Hitler and uh, his death machinery. Uh, despite these historic facts, um, Austria, for now more than 60 years, has portrayed itself as uh, the first victim of the Anschluss and of National Socialism. Over the past 10 years, Austria has tried to depict itself as a country that is committed to dealing with its past and emphasized its work of truth and reconciliation. Uh, but at the same time, Austria has a far-right third president uh, of the parliament who's making derogatory public remarks about the uh, president of the Jewish community in Vienna. And just to give you another example, an Austrian holiday resort recently uh, made headlines by turning away a Jewish family 
due to what they said were bad experiences in the past. So these facts, among many others, beg the question of what historical lessons uh, Austria has learned. Um, probably not the most significant one, which is Israel's right to exist. Um, it's necessary to recognize the Holocaust as uh, the genocide of the Jewish people in, or in order to understand the collective trauma of the Jews. Um, out of this circumstance, a very unique and special awareness and consciousness has developed. An identity that made a common destiny out of Judaism. Austria has long been considered a so-called latecomer in consciously dealing with its role in the persecution of Jews in, during World War II. So it really seems as if Austria has not yet learned its lessons. Um, the foundations for Austria's good relations with Iran uh, were laid shortly after Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini seized power. After the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, was overthrown in 1979, then Chancellor of Austria Bruno Kreisky proclaimed that nothing has changed for Austria since the country had ties with the Iranian nation and not with its respective government. In the 80s, as a result of this policy, Vienna was one of the major hubs through which the Khomeini regime established business contacts with other European countries. Michael Friedl, who is the Austrian Foreign Trade Commissioner in Iran, stated, there has been an Austrian Foreign Trade Commission office in Iran for 50 years. The bilateral relations have survived the Shah era, the Islamic Revolution, the war between Iran and Iraq, and every UN sanction that has been issued due to Iran's nuclear program. Iran is traditionally an important market for Austria. And now I quote uh, Michael Friedel, the Austrian Foreign Trade Commission in Iran again, who said, due in no, no small part to its energy and gas resources, Iran continues to be a valuable business partner, only four hours of flight away from Vienna. In 2007, the US Under Secretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Stuart Levy, traveled through Europe in order to talk to banks about the consequences of their relations with Iran. His message was, you must either decide between friend or foe. In Austria, Levy was so fervent that he was asked not to return, ever. However, the negative stance toward the pressure emanating from the US is not limited to just the banking sector. Many Austrian companies are willing to participate in projects and are currently planning new investments there, but I'll come back to that later. Um, and I'm gonna focus on, on Austrian investments in Iran. Um, now, the OMV deal with Iran, which is gonna underline the strong ties both countries have with each other. In April 2007, uh, the Austrian Energy Group, group ONV signed a deal with Iran's national oil company. This deal has been valued at nearly 22 billion euros. Uh, OMV is the biggest oil corporation in Central Europe, and the state of Austria holds 31.5% of its shares. The agreement signed between both countries found support among all parties in the Austrian parliament. Despite Iran's non-compliance with every UN resolution regarding its controversial nuclear program. So how can such behavior be reconciled with the sense of responsibility that Austria bears for the Holocaust and for Israel's right to exist? Ahmadinejad, president of Iran, and his government have celebrated the signings of these letters of intent between the National Iranian Oil Company and Austria's OMD. And Austria has been praised to the skies. Austria played down the deal as a pure business matter instead of reinforcing the pressure to which the Iranian regime has been exposed. Vienna is just filling the gap for Tehran. Austria seems to have acted in the illusion that a nuclear armed Iran would have absolutely no impact on Europe. Thomas Huema, who is uh, an OMV spokesman, said, ONV cannot take responsibility for the political situation in a country. 
But like most important enterprises in Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company is held firmly in the hands of religious foundations, traders, and business people who co-financed the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Since the Revolutionary Guard controlled the nuclear and arms project, a program, sorry, this in turn would mean that Austria, uh, OMV would be indirectly co-financing the Iranian nuclear program. And that means OMV is a silent partner of a terror regime. On the occasion of the Global Day for Action of Action for Human Rights in Iran in July 2009, OMV was admonition due to its activities in the Islamic Republic. In April of 2007, right after the letters of intent between OMV and the National Iranian Oil Company were signed, then Austrian member of parliament, Kaspar Einem, who belonged to the Social Democratic Party, stated, and I quote, we believe that a strategy which maintains talks will ultimately have better chances for success than sanctions. Overall, we would be pleased if OMV manages to close the deal. Wolfgang Schüssel, who was then the chairman of the ÖVP, which is Austria's, Austrian People's Party, stated that OMV deserved absolute support. Even though he did see a short-term problem with regard to Iran's nuclear program, he held that, o that the OMV deal was to be a long-term endeavor. Green Party Member of Parliament Ulrike Lunacek also had no objections to the deal, but did say that the timing might not be the best. Reinhard Bösch, who was a Freedom Party member of parliament at that time, also had a favorable view of the business deal. And he said, if there are no general issues with regard to Austrian legislation, there are no grounds for dissent. BZÖ representative Herbert Scheibner, who was a member of the Alliance for the Future of Austria, another party, spoke of a step in the right direction. And Former Austrian Foreign Minister Ursula Plasnik, in 2007, also con considered the deal to be merely a business transaction. In the summer of 2007, Austria's OMV announced and said, OMV is on equal footing with its business partners. Ultimately, the respect for people and the environment is part of our ethical principles. However, the human rights situation in Iran has deteriorated severely since Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was first elected in 2005. So that alone proves that Iran cannot be a partner on equal footing. Torture, random arrests, and imprisonment are prevalent methods in Iran. Iran is the current holder of a world record, which is being the country with the highest number of public executions. Thus, Iran, as a partner of Austria, is an operative of the Revolutionary Guards, who governs with terror. In 2005, after Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was first elected, he said, Israel must be wiped off the map. He also said, the establishment of the Zionist regime was a move by the world oppressor against the Islamic world. And he further added, anybody who recognizes Israel will burn in the fire of the Islamic nation's fury. And in September 2009, he repeatedly called the Holocaust a myth. According to Matthias Künzel, who is a German political researcher and professor in Germany, these statements are not so far from that expressed in a Nazi directive of 1943, which I'm going to quote right now. It said, this war will end with anti-Semitic world revolution and with the extermination of Jewry throughout the world both of which are the precondition for an enduring peace. Just as Hitler's utopia that I just quoted, his German peace required the extermination of the Jews. So the Iranian leadership's Islamic peace is conditioned on the elimination of Israel. By supporting and encouraging the OMV deal with Iran, Austria disregards the most important consequence resulting from the Holocaust, which is the very existence of the State of Israel. Thinking about the Austrian government supporting a regime that publicly hangs children and that pursues a nuclear weapons development program is clearly alarming. 
<coughs> so if respect for the victims of the Holocaust still counts anything in Austria, then any enterprise or bank doing business with the only country in the world that has made the Holocaust denial a component of its foreign policy must be subject to public censure. If the Austrian civil society wishes to make good on its claims to have learned about the lessons of history, then it must exert pressure on its government until this government does what has to be done in order to prevent an Iranian nuclear bomb. There are approximately 680 Austrian companies that have business dealings with Iranian companies or with the Iranian states. Around 35 Austrian companies have branch offices in Iran, and another 500 have business dealings with the Islamic Republic every now and then. Today, of course, only a few speak publicly about their involvement with uh, Iran because it's a very delicate issue and nobody is really proud and outgoing about this. But in 2006, the uh, Iranian Chamber of Trade President Kamushi remarked, Austria is our gateway to the European Union. Austrian exports to Iran have doubled since the year 2002. However, it is the envisioned deal between OMV and Iran that has made Austria a long-term strategic partner of the Islamic Republic. In June 2004, the Austrian Trade Council offered a workshop on Iran in order to instruct companies in how to intensify their dealings with Iran despite all the EU and UN sanctions. In March 2009, on the occasion of the visit of the Iranian Trade Council President Mohammad Nahavandian, Austrian Trade Council President Christoph Leitl underscored the excellent economic relations with Iran. Following the protests surrounding the Iranian presidential elections in June 2009, Michael Friedl, who I quoted before, who is the Austrian Foreign Trade Commissioner in Iran, publicly appealed to companies to not, discount, not to discount Iran as a business partner due to the political events. He stated that the disputes between followers of uh, Mir Hossein Mousavi, who was Ahmadinejad's main challenger in the presidential elections, and militias close to the government had a minimal impact on economic dealings of Austrian companies in Iran. In comparison, as you said before, German the German government appealed to companies to voluntarily reduce their business ties with Iran. <coughs> they called this... All subsidizing the trade. <laughs> <laughs> they called it discouragement. I know exactly what you mean, that there's a huge difference between the government and the economy. It's also the system that plays into that. But many companies, are made, mainly banks, such as the Deutsche Bank or the Presner Bank and the Commerzbank, have since heeded the government's call. Political pressure on German companies is mounting. And trade between Germany and Iran was down by 22% in the first three months of 2009. And just now, uh, January 26, uh, German company Siemens, German engineering company, uh, said that it would, would, re would reject any new orders coming from Iran uh, because of too much uh, pressure coming from the international community. Um, after Siemens declared to pull out of the deal, uh, of any new deals, other German companies slowly follow. Um, it's becoming more and more difficult for them to do doing business with Iran, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're not doing it at all. They just try to find third countries to close the deal through. Iran is considered the leading sp national sponsor of international terrorism worldwide. It supports the fight against the West with money which it supplies to terror organizations uh, such as Hezbollah, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The Austrian collective conscience has a history of forgetting and suppressing, up to the point where Austria even refuses to actually do something in order to prevent another killing of Jews. Austria has tried to improve its ties with Iran in every sector of the Iranian economy. In December 2009, a Western diplomat said, Austria is slowing down sanctions against Iran. This is not only due to economic reasons. The Austrians obviously believe that conflicts can be solved exclusively through dialogue. I'll just give you an example about 
something that uh, Iran organized, which was the Holocaust Conference in Tehran that was held in December 2006. Uh, when they planned a two-day-long Holocaust uh, conference to examine whether the Holocaust actually happened or not. With this conference, the world actually experienced a significant development because the ideological center of falsification of history has been shifted to Iran. In uh, 2006, Hezbollah wanted to organize a similar conference already in Beirut, but the Lebanese government uh, did not allow it. In Tehran, however, the uh, 60 participants coming from 30 different nations were being welcomed as if they would be part of some state visit. From the neo-Nazis' point of view, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is the dignitary who has begun the fight for the concept of the Holocaust as a myth. Among the participants of the conference were three Austrians. Given the, number, given the size of Austria, this number is enormous. Denying, qualifying, or approving the Shoah is part of Iran's ideology. Neo-Nazis adore Ahmadinejad and his followers and publicly show solidarity with the Iranian president. And to just give you a small example of, of how it works in Austria, um, former member of parliament Andreas Mölzer uh, said that he and his peers would always campaign for the cause of Iran and would condemn imperialistic Zionism. In 2006, Mölzer was seen wearing a t-shirt with Ahmadinejad's portrait on it, and uh, below it had the slogan of the uh, Holocaust Conference that was titled, A World Without, a World Without Science. And so he had that printed on the front of his t-shirt and he was running around like this. Since the uh, Islamic Revolution in 1979, contacts between Iranian Islamists and Austrian neo-Nazis have grown. On the occasion of the um, Holocaust Conference in Tehran in December 2006, Walter Ochsenberger, an Austrian neo-Nazi from Vorarlberg, said, <coughs> this is the first time in, his, in the history of Holocaust world politics that an entire government is questioning the existence of the Holocaust on a scientific level. Unfortunately, the Islamic Republic does not have to fear any consequences of doing so. And uh, just a couple of days ago, on January 30th, there was a gala event, a ball of right-wing student organizations held in uh, one of the Austrian government's uh, most beautiful places. Um, and uh, the police came with tear gas and arrested 14 demonstrators who demonstrated against this event. That's how it's being done in Austria. The Iranian nuclear program and Iran's hidden nuclear agenda have not only brought an imbalance in the Middle East and in the Gulf region, but have also created a critical situation with regard to security throughout the entire <coughs> world. In just a few months, Iran could have a nuclear explosive, um, and its nuclear program is currently in a decisive stage. The developments of the past year and Iran's current nuclear policies do not point toward a change of heart. Iran seems to be immune to any measures taken by the international community thus far. A prompt solution in the nuclear conflict seems unrealistic. Vienna has gained relevance ever since Austria became a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. However, Austria has accrued a reputation of being very soft on Iran ever since it joined forces with Italy in 2008 um, and both countries are heading a group within the EU which is against additional pressure and measures against the Islamic, Repu uh, Islamic Republic um, outside of UN sanctions. From that time on, public pressure on Austria has continuously increased. The US, Great Britain, and France have all complained about Vienna's slack position. Iran has been expanding its network of terror beyond the Middle East and has deployed Hezbollah and splinter groups such as the <coughs> Iranian Revolutionary Guards in order to recruit and train sleeper cells in other countries. In January 2009, 70,000 potential suicide attackers volunteered to carry out a terrorist attack in Israel. Freedom House has classified the level of personal freedom in Iran at 6.0, 7.0 being the lowest and 1.0 the highest level. 
Amnesty, Amnesty International has counted 39 executions of minors since the year 1990. The last execution took place in January 2009. Around 381 people were executed in Iran in the year 2009. And I'm not mentioning what happened in the year 2009 uh, after the presidential elections, which is still going on. A person convicted of murder in Iran has no right to appeal for probation. This is contradictory to the Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. One thing is certain. Iran cannot be stopped by one singular element of the international community, but only through a cooperation of Western powers. The United States must work with Europe and take a uniform stance. Ideally, Russia and China would also support this. It's not very likely, though. The economic and diplomatic isolation of Iran must be one of the fundamental approaches in confronting Iran and its nuclear program. In order to achieve this, individual countries such as Austria must be convinced that only a complete suspension of all economic relations with Iran can lead to a positive outcome of the conflicts surrounding Iran's nuclear program. Not until all international players join together could Iran be convinced that the diplomatic and economic losses caused, caused to the country by its nuclear program are greater than the politic potential gains. So I would conclude this by just saying um, a few options that Austria or the Western, the Western world would have in order to approach this issue. Uh, so what, what measures could Austria take? I would say there are three um, levels on which measures could be taken. The first one would be economic, an economic level. Um, starting with uh, de stopping to uh, deal with Iran and investing with Iran, closing new deals with Iran, it's to start with. Another, op another option would be, and I'm not talking only about Austria, it's just the, West, the Western world in general. Uh, a naval blockage targeting refined oil uh, because Iran is uh, the largest oil exporter within the OPEC uh, and possesses the world's second largest natural gas reserves, but it has not, uh, Iran does not have enough oil refineries, uh, which is why the country needs to re-import its own oil once it's refined. So a naval blockade on Iran would prevent Iran from importing refined oil. Uh, that would have a huge impact on its economy. It would virtually be crippling the country. Um, so Iran has two points of vulnerabilities um, in its system. Not only is it dependent on oil for financial reasons, but it also needs to get its own oil refined. Um, then the other op another option is freezing bank assets and um, preventing arms sales. Um, <coughs> which would also um, go with, uh, with uh, working on an economic level. The second level would be diplomatic steps, which means taking out diplomats and um, issuing travel bans on diplomats, um, stopping meetings between Austrian and Iranian diplomats. Um, because once uh, these meetings happen and travel happens, it shows legitimacy uh, to this regime. So that sends the wrong signal. And obviously, on the third level, it would be the consciousness level, which means that in that case, Austria would have to work um, uh, and to push its institutions in order to take care of uh, which responsibility Austria has in terms of its own history with regard to Iran and with regard to uh, Iran's nuclear program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for it. It's, uh, it was a rich presentation because I had about 20 questions. But, um, I'll only ask one. <laughs> um, and we can open up for questions. So thank you very much. Um, so I think inherent in your paper is something I find fascinating. And I think given your background too, what you did your doctorate on in this paper, there seems to be an assumption that Germany, Austria, that they have learned the lesson. Any, if there are any nations in the world that have learned the lessons of the Holocaust, it's Germany and Austria. They, they've really learned their education system. Uh, yeah. Well, 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 There's okay. a big difference between Germany and Austria. 
Okay. Fair enough. So respond accordingly. But but I think even when I was in Vienna to for this global forum, there is this assumption that they know uh, the history of the Holocaust. They have learned the lessons. So these people fighting uh, the question over Iran. There seems to be some claim that there is an education that maybe the lessons. And I was thinking, given your your background and your research. I know like in cultural studies, we look at, say, you know, sort of the structures of racism and sexism and gender inequality. It's reflective in our institutions, even in our language. There's a whole body of knowledge that really goes deep into looking at the history of race and class and sex and all those sort of things in our, in our society. And yet, when it comes to anti-Semitism, that type of analysis is really, it doesn't exist. It's just not there. We have the history of Holocaust, but we don't really look at the, the language and the culture of anti-Semitism, uh, at least in the educational systems. There's some exceptional scholars, but it's certainly not reflected in the education system. So why, why do you think that there, even in your paper, and maybe Austria is, and I know Austria is quite different than Germany, but even in your paper, there's this assumption that, uh, that, that there are lessons that were learned, and yet, not only is Ahmadinejad, as you say, building a nuclear weapon to destroy the state of Israel, Ahmadinejad, and I think it's even more pernicious and more dangerous than the nuclear weapons program, is using the same ideology that the Nazis used, that Europeans in general used uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, i.e. the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, um, you know, we, we learned that the, the, the concentration camps of the Shoah didn't begin with the bricks and mortars of the camps and the railroads, but it, it, it began with words and ideas. And those words and ideas are being manipulated and used very effectively by the Iranian regime. And yet, in Austria, in, in, uh, in Germany, where there are laws against Holocaust denial, as you point out, there is this rush to do business with people that are using the same ideology that created the Holocaust in the first place and are engaged in Holocaust denial. So, so what what? So, so on the one hand, I find it absurd in a way that we who are fighting anti-Semitism are surprised. Because these these views that are ingrained and embedded in society don't disappear. There isn't a, an, an eureka moment that erases the structures of hatred, from the ideology to the religion to the political culture. It doesn't disappear. So so why are we surprised? And if should we be surprised? And if we are not surprised, then, then, then what should our reaction be as scholars or people who are dealing with this issue? As, as Europe continues to do, perhaps, I would say business as usual, because I, I'm, not, I'm more skeptical of these uh, unilateral divestments by Siemens. But what, what, what should we be doing? Uh, I'm surprised that you're surprised. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, at least no, I'm surprised by the people. I'm, I'm surprised. Okay, I'm surprised at the people who are fighting against the Semitism. We have this mantra that these people have worked. I'm, I'm surprised at, at our reaction. No, but I mean, if you raise the question, why does Austria look at this, you know, things with Iran and the issue from a from an economic? perspective, then that's all they do. They only look at it from an economic perspective. I would not, I, I don't think that any Austrian member of parliament or anybody who's involved in, in deals or in encouraging, for instance, the OMB in order to, to, to go ahead with this deal, uh, thinks of it on an ethical level. I think that's out of the question. What they see is the money and they see the opportunity and they see that this is the big deal for Austria. And if they don't do it, there will be a Chinese company who's going to yeah. fill the gap, or a Russian company who's going to do it. Hang on, hang on. But, if, but this is fascism. If corporate, if corporate control of an, an economic political, this is fascism. Forget Nazism. Fascism is where corporations control the, the economy of a society. So if the Austrian parliament, the German Bundestag, is run by economic uh, opportunity, Corporations are dictating in some capacity the policy, then we're in a fascist state. That's what you said. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said, yeah. I, that's a question. No, I, 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 I do think that Austria is trying to, I don't know, they, 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 always, have, they, they always tend to have a head in the sand policy. You know, they always dig their hands underneath the ground and pretend nothing's going on. And they're just, you know, 
doing fine because nobody's looking and they don't see anything, so nothing's happening. And that's what they're doing. And I, I do think they're trying, you know, on an institutional or educational level, to try to work on reconciliation and 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 uh, build the, the educational system in a way that people are being taught about, you know, what happened, and it's given a sense of responsibility, but it doesn't go beyond that. It does not go beyond that. And if you were talking about language, that's a huge issue, because language is, is, is a huge issue when it comes to anti-Semitism. So, for instance, it's still being considered sort of an insult if you say the word Jew, Jude, in German, and it's still something you wouldn't do. So, you hardly will find that word in any, you know, newspaper or people would not dare to say it out loud despite the fact that it's not an insult. These things have stayed. So there's a there's something you can't really grasp it what it is. It's not out there anti Semitism where people, you know, say Heil Hitler on the street or run around with flags. It's very subtle. It's a sense, it's 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 very hard to qualify. Thank you. Um, can you comment on, the, there was a campaign in Austria called Stop the Bomb, or there still is. And um, after one year working against the OMU deal. Um, I, I'm going to interrupt just to the early good a mm -hmm. fellow here, and she's one of the founders of Stop the Bomb in Germany, in Germany and in Austria. <laughs> it was founded in Austria, so, and there was um, news that the deal stopped. And the uh, politicians that you mentioned, like Ulrike Lunacek and even members of the um, Conservative Party, they now criticize the deal. Can you comment on this? Is it, um, are they doing it again now? Are they working behind the scenes going on with that deal? Or um, there is not, there's not much happening with this deal. I mean, right now, because now, so Switzerland is the I biggest, uh, biggest um, the country that has the biggest deal with Iran, the EGL. It's that is correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. But there's not much going on at this point. I mean, there have not been any further developments so far. This deal with Goldie and uh, the National Iranian Oil Company. However, this is not due to any you know, political uh, change of heart, and that people suddenly realize, oh my God, maybe we should not deal with terrorists. But uh, that's only due to the financial situation. It's because of the financial crisis and because of oil prices that this deal is being put on hold. But the letters are still signed, the letters of intent. So this is going to eventually work out. It's just a matter of time, I guess. I, I found your paper insightful. Um, I had a question regarding um, regarding who the pressure should be put on. Is it the Austrian government that the pressure should be on to restrict um, international business relations between Austrian companies and Iranian companies, or is it, or should the pressure be um, allocated to the actual companies, corporations themselves within Austria? Um, it wasn't made clear. Um, who do you think? This is a great question. <laughs> it oh. is. Um, it's um, it's a great question because it's there's such a big difference between government on the one one hand and, <coughs> and economy on the other hand. But uh, in the case of Austria, I do think it would be uh, worth <coughs> putting pressure on the government because uh, I think the government could try to reach out and set the right signals um, and maybe, maybe change something. I'm not very optimistic at this point, but you know, we, should, we should put pressure on the Austrian government. Also because in the case of <coughs> the OB, the Austrian, uh, state of Austria share, holds 31.5% of its share, so that's a large number. Mm -hmm. So they do have a saying uh, when it comes to, to ONV, for instance. But uh, it would definitely send the right signal also internationally if you have the Austrian government uh, being outspoken about this issue internationally, publicly, like the German government is doing with Angela Merkel or Nicolas Sarkozy in France or Gordon Brown in, in the UK. That would be great, but you haven't seen any Austrian politician going out there. But the important information, Merkel, she wrote, it's like poetic. For me, it's poetry. She yeah. was the Knesset in the Congress and can make me <laughs> cry. But this government is still subsidizing work and uh, trade in your end. But I'm just saying that already is something. I mean, that's, that's more than the Austrians have to offer. They have somebody who's the head of the 
of the country. But, continues, but my, my, the question I want to ask, is it too late for sanctions? If tomorrow the Austrians and the European Union had full sanctions, does Iran have the bomb? Is it too late? I don't think it's too late. Well, okay. Cool. <laughs> sure. um, it's difficult to be surprised that politicians act on economic interests, so I'm not surprised by that. But um, what about the role of intellectuals in Austria today? I know nothing about intellectual life in Austria in terms of um, their efforts to define this issue, and, and who, who do you look at in Austria as, as an intellectual that is worth listening to and is trying to shape the public debate? have to look very close to you. <laughs> <laughs> very far. <laughs> there aren't that many. She's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good excuse. <laughs> Zweig, it was over. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I am sure that there, there are Austrians, uh, intellectuals, also, and researchers that would, um, you know, like to work in that direction, but it's not very popular. And Austrians tend to be quite proud of this deal because, you know, we Austrians managed to have this 22 billion euro deal with Iran, and no other country that has the size of Austria has achieved that. So that's rather something people are proud of instead of trying to you indicated that economics seems to trump human rights in Austria based upon the composition of the government and their policies. In order to bring pressure to bear on Austria, therefore, uh, you'd have to apply some sort of an economic pressure. What type of economic pressure could be brought to bear on Austria to persuade them to sever or limit ties with Iran. I'll work on that. <laughs> what is their principal source of revenue in Austria? Is it tourism? It was a lot of, large part of it, I would say, but it's very widespread. I mean, if you look at the Austrian companies that are dealing with Iran, it's a widespread, um, it's, it's a widespread list of, of companies. I mean, you have companies fabricating beer, and it's uh, non-alcoholic beer, but they're uh, really huge in Tehran. And you have branches that supply um, uh, fire department gear and, and cars and steel. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different, uh, different companies that are involved. They even fabricate uh, cigarette packs. Comment on the first part of the paper on the language. You use the terms like uh, death machinery, which is an euphemism. There is a, that doesn't exist something like that. Austrian conscience, which doesn't exist. People have conscience, and these are very misleading terms or uh, or lessons of history. They are very misleading terms because um, they are used especially by the communist regimes when they try not to address an issue. And um, yeah, I would have. A, problem with this, that there is a, they are very ideological and they don't, they're euphemism, they're people killed people, not, uh, there is no good that machinery, or Austria doesn't have a conscience and it's not unitary. During the Nazi ideology, it was constructed as a, a country having a conscience and being in this very, very integral and very unitary. But in fact, there are, there are more voices there, which, right? Yeah. This would be my comment on the language. Yeah. What is the position of the European mm -hmm. Union with Austria's yes. yes. And is anything that has anything done or mentioned that is applied to the European Union? The European Union is one of the major trading partners of Iran as a union. Um, but there, the political is, body. There, is, there, there are differences within the European Union. I mean, there are different, uh, different stances, different point of views. There is one group that is uh, pushing forward for sanctions, additional sanctions, sanctions on an EU level. So countries such as uh, Germany and France and the UK, for instance. And others, where Austria belongs to, Austria, Italy being the main the main countries that are totally against additional pressures outside of the UN sanctions. So it's pretty divided. So there is no position of the European position, Union position. 
Traveling down to there, we went to several concentration camps, and it was just part of what we were doing. It was not a Jewish group, quite the contrary. It had something, it was connected to the Humanity Center in North Carolina. And we were all shocked to find out that the Austrian schools were not teaching the Holocaust. And this was not true in Germany, and it was not true in any other place that we visited. And. Um, I was just wondering if Austria was able to keep itself and what would happen if they became less homogeneous. I mean, this was very shocking to us. There were never any Austrian children traveling through the camp camps, but there were German children. Mm -hmm. They had, the, the Germany had dozens mm -hmm. of groups of young people going through. And nothing from Austria, but what really shocked us was when we asked at two schools was anything taught about the Holocaust and nothing more. So I just, uh, I'm not at all surprised, you see, to, to hear this. Uh, because I think there's a, there's a, and I don't know because I don't live there and it's just a visit, but I just have a feeling from their reaction to some things that there's an undercurrent there that just doesn't, that is strong and always has been strong. It's part of their culture. And I would agree that Germany has tried, uh, has made all sorts of efforts. But I can't say that. So I'm not surprised to see it among the group of corporations as well. If you take away the ethical question, the moral question, you'll have to have an economic justification for doing business. Profit. There is a resolution going to the U.S. House attempting to apply some countervailing pressures on companies that do business with Iran. Is there any prospect or any concern in Austria that this might have, might, might pass and it might be endorsed by our president and become law? So far, I couldn't sense any. Um, they are prepared, it seems, to step in. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the feeling I run again. No, Somehow I mean, they will no. always manage. The, no, the resolution is attempting to say if you do business with Iran, you get denied business deals in the U.S. That would be a choice they would have to make. The yes, yes. That would be the consequence. That's an economic pressure. Yeah, you can, I can say this for Germany. This is what works. This is why Siemens pulled out. They and they made the decision to pull out. Within two days of the resolution being uh, no, being, no, being no, no. We, um, it was they tried to get a contract in Los Angeles, a 300 million euro contract for um, building railroads or something and it was very important for them and there was negative press here in last September and a lot of uh, organizations tried to convince the Los Angeles authorities not to give uh, this deal to a company who was doing business in Iran and they had very some negative um, news articles on that and this was in this, uh, September and they did not get the contract Siemens and they made the decision to pull out of Iran in October and so I think it's very important, and it's a very strong signal. Uh, for especially, I can only say this for German companies, but I think this might be the same for Austrian companies as well. That um, business in Iran is not so important in general. Iran is a is a, an interesting market, but in the moment it does not play a big role compared to the U.S. market, which is much much more important for every German company who does who is working internationally. 
So I think it's very important. And now when we see German companies um, announce that they will pull out of Iran, this is, uh, I think, one of the major factors. And so this can exert pressure on companies in Germany. And I, 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 totally, I totally agree. I just, the question was just a sense of you know, people being but worried. But it's the grassroots, it's the local right. municipality making those decisions. The, the alternative, which is going to the House, is a US state uh, national resolution that would put yeah. the direct pressure. Mm -hmm. yes. Now maybe it's both sides that influence yes. each other. Yes. Yes. I, get, I guess the next step for you, I mean this paper would be to explore sort of the ethical considerations mm -hmm. for doing business. Um, as early as, you know, in the 1960s, Milton Friedman published, and I've been having an ongoing discussion with Ulrika about this um, throughout this week, um, published his famous famous book and his famous paper um, in which he said the corporate responsibility of businesses is to make profits, is to increase profits, and as long as you stay within the legal parameters of society, whatever legal parameters there are within your nation and so on, you're able to, you should be able to do business freely. It doesn't matter if you're if you're harming other people along the way, as long as you're staying consistent with legal, with legality within those uh, within those limitations, you should be able to do uh, business freely. Um, I, I certainly didn't give credence to to um, anything that was said until I um, went to Israel last year to do my field research, and I was interviewing I interviewed both Israeli and Palestinian <coughs> companies in the West Bank, and the West Bank companies, um, several of them, were telling me what what you're suggesting in this paper. They were suggesting that. Um, Israel has put all these restrictions on us, we're, we're completely landlocked, we don't have any outside borders, this is a big prison, blah, blah, blah. And they were saying the way that we pressure the Israeli government because we don't have any voice directly against Israel um, is to call our partners in the West, call German companies, call American companies and tell them that if you don't tell Israel to, to pretty much lax their border, lack their political conditions that they put on, Palestine, we're going to stop doing businesses with you. And they were using this exact same rationale by which to pressure Israel from from um, from losing political ground against Palestine, so to speak. So, um, you know, I think that the next step for you would be to consider what are the normative takeaways in terms of business ethics, um, in terms of doing international business and engaging in international business practices. Like, are there, there should there be A, B, C, D? These are the general sort of rules that companies should follow when they when they engage in IB processes. Um, but, but I guess that would be the next step for you at this point. Uh, about uh, the context. Iran, Hamas, genocidal anti-Semitism, oh, subjugation of gender, it's an ethical issue. I would just like to make two comments that laws do not equate justice, A, and B, the uh, poetic statement that Merkel made with uh, Shimon Peres, bad poetry to boot, has no <laughs> legal teeth whatsoever. It was exactly. just, it was nothing but a statement. Propaganda. Mm. Exactly. You know, we've had uh, laws that, about slavery, about this and that, and there was a, was a confusion that laws are inherently ethical and, and, and are just. And I think we have to stop this dream that laws are just. Do you think you can print this uh, paper in the Christian newspaper? The way it is? Or the, summer, the, 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 summer, the summary of this, of this paper? Okay, if I plan to stay here, <laughs> thinking it might work. <laughs> not going back ever. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there would be anyone who would print this. I think it could be quite difficult to do this. Could you publish it on the internet? I'm sure she could publish it here in many yeah. places, but the question is, can she do it in Austria? Yeah. Well, well, you know, well so the internet is international. Is, of course, yeah. but, but especially in Austria, yeah. the question is. Yeah. Yeah. What's the relationship between Kurt Waldheim and the Iran, the Iranian revolutionary regime? This is an issue that nobody I haven't seen anywhere, and I guarantee you there's something there. Okay, something to look into. Anybody else? Any other comments? So, on the 
Thank you very much.